Hello, I am Dr. Kayla Miles. My pronouns are she and her. I am the first Black woman to earn a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, and I am a former science policy fellow at Research America. Thank you, Research America family, for inviting me to be here today. As the judges deliberate to determine the winners of this year's Flash Talk competition, it is my distinct honor to moderate a discussion focused on career paths and professional development with Secretary Shalala and Dr. Zahuni. The Honorable Dr. Shalala served as Secretary of Health and Human Services from 1993 to 2001. She has also served in the U.S. House of Representatives from 2019 to 2021 and as Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development in the Center Administration. Thank you so much for your service. One of the most honored academics of her generation, Dr. Shalala served as President of the University of Miami, President of Hunter College of the City University of New York, and Chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Madison just to name a few of her accomplishments. Dr. Elias Zerhouni is Professor Emeritus of Radiology and Biomedical Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Zerhouni was most recently the President of Global Research and Development and a member of the Executive Committee for Sanofi from 2011 to 2018. Dr. Zerhouni just served as Director of the National Institutes of Health from 2002 to 2008. Dr. Zahuni has also founded or co-founded five startup companies authored and authored more than 200 publications. He also holds several patents. Thank you both so much for being here today and sharing your time and expertise with us. Now it is my privilege to ask both of you a few questions. To begin, can each of you share what inspired you to pursue a career in public health and or public service? Was it a particular experience during your childhood, a role model perhaps, or did you find your career, uh, or excuse me, did your career path find you? Um, Secretary Shalala, we'd love to start with you. Well, it wasn't an organized uh, uh, response that in which I ended up in, in healthcare, in public health in particular, uh, leading institutions that had large um, health enterprises. Um, but I was inspired to public service by John Kennedy, and um, particularly when he offered the Peace Corps. And I was one of the first Peace Corps volunteers uh, in this country. And after that, you know, I just fell in love with politics and policy and went off to get my PhD after the Peace Corps and then ended up teaching politics and public policy. And I also had the opportunity to go into government uh, initially because they were trying to attract women in the Carter administration. And later, um, after leading two great institutions of higher education uh, to be secretary of HHS. Meanwhile, I had a lot of experience in healthcare, both uh, leading institutions that had schools of public health as well as nursing, as well as a medical school in Wisconsin, as well as big um, healthcare systems. Uh, Wisconsin had a huge West healthcare system, including hospitals and uh, lots of scientists. I also had an opportunity to sit on the director's console um, at NIH uh, long before I ever went to be HHS secretary. Thank you so much. If I could ask just a brief follow-up question, I think it is amazing that you are one of the first women to serve in the Peace Corps. I have two close friends that serve in the Peace Corps as well. Um, can you just speak to um, what it was like for you to just shatter one of those glass ceilings and sort of the, the progress that has been made for women thus far? Well, you know, I was I, I really stood on the shoulders of a lot of women who had already broken uh, in opportunities. So I was I have rarely been in my career the only woman in a room. Uh, there's no question that I was the second woman to head a major research university when I became chancellor of the University of Wisconsin at Madison. But, uh, but my generation uh, really stood on the shoulders of an earlier generation that broke a lot of glass ceilings and gave us opportunities. And my career has been helped by that. Um, and now, obviously, I was well-trained and had opportunities. In graduate school, I had a sense uh, there were no tenured women at Syracuse when I was at, in the graduate school. 
But I think the men thought that um, since many of us couldn't get into the Ivy Leagues, into the PhD programs, that if they trained the women, that we would have breakthrough opportunities. So there were a number of women in graduate school with me that went on to distinguish careers, but it was an all-male faculty that trained us. Wow, thank you so much for sharing. And I really like the phrasing of standing on the shoulders of those that came before you, because I can definitely attest to, to doing the same. You have some very strong, strong shoulders. <laughs> um, Dr. Zahuni, we're going to uh, transition to you. Um, can you share with us what inspired you to pursue a career in public health and uh, public service? Like Donna, I mean, there was, there was no pre-planning. It just happened uh, because I grew up in a poor country, um, Algeria. That's where I was educated. And um, my father uh, was a professor of physics and mathematics. So I was all destined to become a mathematician or physicist or somebody in engineering. And I had no uh, attraction to public health or medicine at the time until as a medical student, as a student, a university student, I went to the mountains of Algeria and I had an experience there that really was an eye opener for me. And it was a lady who was a, a, a patient with tuberculosis, pulmonary TB, and she went to the local uh, dispensary and they, they had nothing. They had no drugs. They had absolutely nothing. And um, and the uh, the person who was there, the, the sort of healthcare provider, just opened the, an ice box and, and, and she was so febrile that he put her in, in front of the ice box and, and he said, how do you feel? You feel better? She said, oh yeah, I feel better. And I was amazed at the empathy and the gentleness of this gentleman towards this lady in the deep mountains out there. And that's the day I decided to go into medicine. And so I went to medical school because I thought I could help the, uh, these people who I had witnessed had absolutely no help at the time. And then during my medical school, I realized that uh, there was a huge need for physical sciences, mathematics and physics and biology. And that's when I connected, if you will, uh, between the imaging sciences, the first CAT scans, and the mathematics and physics background that I had. So I decided to pursue research in that context. And uh, to do that, I immigrated to the United States when I was 24 years old. I went to Johns Hopkins, and this is where I had my uh, basic training in, uh, in radiology. This is where I started my research. And I, my research was in CAT scans and understanding algorithms and understanding how you made a medical imaging test provide knowledge about tuberculosis. And I did a lot of research on chest imaging, for example, for all diseases. And that led me to a career that then led me to become chair of my department and I became dean for research. And, and the thing that was amazing is that I was in an institution that really looked at career development as a responsibility. They were not just using you, they were advising you, they were providing you with a a network of mentors and peers that were all motivated to make a difference. And I think the institution in which I, I, um, I grew was my second home away from my home in Algeria. And that's what led me to make some uh, contributions. The main contribution I made when I was at Hopkins was as a dean for research to break the barriers between the departments. There were physical science departments and health sciences departments. and create a new environment for research, which had me noted uh, at the National Academy of Medicine where I was elected. I was quite young, I was 39 years old. And, and then that led to, to being identified as a, as a troublemaker, uh, I would say, and uh, eventually became the director of NIH in 2002 and Gates Foundation, the rest you know. But none of it was planned. It was really related to a personal experience of the need to truly make a difference uh, in, in, in your contribution. So that's my story. Thank you so much for sharing. You touched on a lot of great points that I feel like early career investigators like myself can really relate to, um, especially sharing your experience immigrating from Algeria to the United States. Um, I think that fits in perfectly with my next question, which would be to talk a little bit more about sort of your cultural background and how your upbringing has sort of influenced your career selection and overall professional development. Um, 
speaking from obvious experience, we know that um, the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in medical progress, and therefore discussing our experiences, our, our diversity of experiences, as it relates to our ethnic backgrounds is just one way in which we can ensure that science and medical progress is accessible to all. So I'm gonna shift gears and switch back to Secretary Shalala. Can you just share with us just a little bit about your upbringing and your cultural background? And if that, if those experiences, if any, have influenced um, sort of where you are today? Yeah, I grew up in the Lebanese community in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, my parents, my grandparents came to this country from Lebanon and um, uh, the language was Arabic uh, in our household, though they used Arabic to keep the children from knowing what they were having conversations about. But it was a big extended family. Um, and um, the community I grew up in, though, was very diverse. Um, it was a lower middle income uh, community in Cleveland and, and my public schools had people of different backgrounds. I used to joke when I got to Hunter College, I could pronounce everybody's name because I had grown up in a neighborhood in which there were so many new immigrants and, and, and children of immigrants um, who had funny last names like I did. And, um, and I learned about multiple cultures and that was really important. I went to, to high school with African-Americans, with many African-Americans. So, and, and certainly in college. So uh, it wasn't just African-Americans, it was people of different ethnic groups. And that did shape me um, in terms of both my family's commitment to immigration and to diversity and the deep cultural roots that uh, were in my community. I came from a big extended family and um, very devoted to culture, uh, to religion and to food. I have to ask before I um, shift and ask uh, Dr. Zuhuni the same question. What is, if I'm trying Lebanese food for the first time, what what must we try? Well, uh, probably kibbe and uh, Ooh, okay, I think... uh, and tabbouleh. Noted. I definitely That's took, uh, it's, it's right there and I will be trying all of those things. Thank you so much. Um, but I also am devoted because oh. I served in Iran okay. uh, to Persian food at the same time. That I sounds delicious. Food. I think I've had Persian food once and it was an excellent experience. Um, Dr. Zahuni, can you just uh, share a little bit more about um, your experience um, immigrating to this country and just sort of how that has um, adjusted or influenced your approach to professional development? Well, you know, I grew up in the third world country, Algeria, at the time of war and then independence. And so there was a huge uh, momentum for uh, diversity. For example, in my medical school, uh, when I went to med school, it was 50% women, 50% men. And um, uh, like Donna, I, I, I spoke Arabic, I spoke French, and I learned English. They were multicultural by nature because of the, the your personal history or really trying to adapt to different environments. I'll tell you the, the one shocking thing that happened when we came here with my wife, who's Algerian too, she's a doctor, and um, I had a job, uh, you know, as a research uh, assistant, and I, come, I came and she didn't, and she wanted to connect, connect with medical students, and she went to the, to the registrar, and she said, could you introduce me to the medical students of the medical school class? And there were seven women out of 120 students in that year. She came back, she was totally shocked. She said, this is America? They only have seven women in a class of 120. This is 1975. And she was absolutely shocked by that. And she said, there's something wrong here. I mean, we, 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 we were equal in Algeria and we're not here. And I said, yeah, you're right. And, and I noticed the fact that there were obstacles. Uh, at the time that I really decided to make a difference about. And so if you look at uh, what I had focused on later, is the fact that my teams and my labs and my department were much stronger when they were diverse. When I became an IH director, I recruited almost 40% uh, of women in the uh, director's ranks of the 24 directors. Um, the same thing is true when you look at industry and you look around the entire ecosystem, there was a real obstacle. It was, uh, the, the word glass ceiling did exist. And when I recruited people, 
the thing that was very interesting to me is that the the, 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 the women, the African Americans didn't have a good network. They didn't have a support network the way the others did. And so you had to almost encourage the support network to achieve diversity and inclusion. And that came from the top. It couldn't come from the bottom up. Hmm. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, you spoke, honestly, I feel like you were preaching directly to my pew, as they would say, um, just um, the importance of being um, having a strong network and having a strong community in order to sort of withstand the obstacles that is graduate education. Um, but you also... Uh, Kayla, Kayla, you know, I, um, I actually chaired the National Academy of Sciences report on um, women and minorities in the sciences and engineering which outlined all of those obstacles. And Dr. Zerhouni is absolutely right. It was a support system. It was a network. It was paying attention to people's careers because we now have huge numbers of young women, for instance, and, and people of color that doing their undergraduate work in science, but getting them through that narrow PhD program requires a real effort on, uh, on departments themselves to make, uh, make sure those support systems are in place and removing those obstacles. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, both of you have underscored um, a, a really important issue, I feel, is that you look to the top in order to sort of set the standard so that, that there are uh, safe spaces for people like myself to pursue higher education degrees. So thank you again for um, under, underscoring just the importance that administrators at these institutions have um, and sort of um, their role and responsibility as they continue to usher in more students like myself. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, it looks like we are cutting close to our um, end time. So I'm gonna ask one more question. Um, as we all know, we are facing an, an ongoing pandemic um, and many early career investigators like myself and many in, in the world in general, to be honest, are, are concerned about the future of their training. Um, and where they can make a true difference, as both of you have made. Uh, how are you keeping hopeful and encouraged during these times? And what advice can you offer to those like myself in our early career stage? You know, I lived through the 1990s when we doubled the NIH budget. And the emphasis that, um, that we made was also on training programs. We have to make sure that while we're supporting scientists, we're also supporting training programs. But we have to make sure that there are jobs at the end of those training programs. Uh, one of the things that I noticed at Madison when I got there was that um, the TAs and the research assistants wanted to stay there forever because there weren't the jobs at the other end. So supporting people um, turned out to be um, more long term than any of the people that were supporting them. That is, I would say to faculty members, how long did it take you to get your PhD and to do your postdoc? And you'd have to add on three or four years for the students that were currently there. So I once said to President Clinton, his legacy would be the NIH. His legacy would be doubling the investment of the NIH and the kind of investments we made in science. And I think that one thing COVID has told us is that we couldn't have gotten those vaccines if Dr. Zarahoni and his colleagues and his predecessors hadn't made these deep investments, not only in the vaccine center, but in the basic science that allowed us to go quickly. Uh, and we have to continue that investment and make sure that as we spin off COVID, we make that case to the American people that it is that investment in science that will make a difference for the COVIDs of the future. I, would, I completely agree with what Donna is saying, and, and I would really add to that the following. I have never seen a more promising time in research and development as today. The progress we've made, thanks to the investments that uh, Donna was mentioning in the 90s, is just uh, breathtaking. I mean, the ability for us to sequence the genome of a single cell, the ability for us to change the genome with CRISPR technology, the ability for us to use artificial intelligence to understand population health, that was never available to us. Actually, when people ask me, say, I wish I could trade 30 years of my life and go back to being a graduate student again, because I think the opportunities are enormous. The number two uh, uh, recommendation I would make is that this 
traditional idea that you just go to a graduate program, PhD, postdoc, and then you try to stick to academia is a very narrow view. The ecosystem of innovation has changed. I mean, there are small startup companies, there are think tanks, there are there's industrial uh, uh, work. You know, NIH is $40 billion, but industry, industrial R&D spend is $140 billion. And I don't know why our education system is so narrowly focused on regenerating the model of the past. You come to me, you'll be an assistant professor, an associate professor, and there's luck, you'll be tenured as a professor. That is a passe, and we need to really tell our graduate students how to navigate the new development pathways that are much more diverse than they used to be, and we're not doing that as effectively as we should. And, and you know, if you even look at COVID, COVID has brought this public-private partnership to a new level, as well as small companies that have produced vaccines and, and, and treatments and other kinds of things. So we always got beat up on these public-private partnerships, but I think we've matured to the point well, we understand it is a partnership. You know, I've been in academia and I've had some luck uh, in having really interesting positions. I've been in government as an IH director. I've been in philanthropy. I work with the Gates Foundation. I've been in industry. And I think all these false barriers that people are putting through are hurting our next generation of innovators and pioneers. And I think you can see it. You can see how, in fact, the cross-fertilization of these fields is much more powerful than isolation of each one of them for, for reasons that, that are not quite understandable today, given the changes. I think with the right uh, uh, um, approach to that, we should really uh, be able to create a generation of a human capital for advancing public health that is second to none in the world. Well, that is... Um, looks about to be our time. So again, thank you so much for sharing with us, um, letting us know just a little bit more about your um, experiences. I don't know about our audience, but I certainly learned a lot. There were a lot of tweetable moments. Um, I think if I could just summarize with hopefully what is less than 240 characters um, from this conversation, we have learned, I think, two tweets. Um, one that investing in science, as Dr. Shalala mentioned, is uh, or actually it creates a, a promising uh, future and present, as Dr. Uh, Elias Zerhuni mentioned. And lastly, I would say that as we um, continue to acknowledge the innovations of our predecessors, those that we stand on the shoulders of, we understand that there is still work to be done um, in our offices and in our communities. So um, we leave behind a very promising uh, future for our successors. So uh, thank you again, Dr. or excuse me, Secretary Shalala, Dr. Zahuni, for your time today. Your advice has been so meaningful to hear. Um, and thank you once more to my family at Research America and our sponsors for prioritizing conversations like these and creating space for early stage career investigators to grow and to thrive. So now it's time to get back to our flash talk competition. And thank you so much for joining us today.